This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The play is Moonshine by Arthur Hopkins, recorded by Klarsach and Greg Evans. Scene. Hut of a moonshiner in the mountain wilds of North Carolina. Door, back left. Window, back right center. Old deal table, right center. Kitchen chair at either side of table, not close to it. Old cupboard in left corner, rude stone fireplace left side. On back wall near door is a rough pencil sketch of a man hanging from a tree. At rise of curtain, a commotion is heard outside of the hut. It's all right, boys. Just leave him to me. Get in there, Mr. Revenue. Revenue, a northerner in city attire, without hat, clothes dusty, is pushed through the doorway. Luke, a lanky, ill-dressed southerner, following, closes door. Revenue's hands are tied behind him. You must excuse the boys for making a demonstration over you, Mr. Revenue, but you see, they don't come across you fellows very freaking. They always get excited. I appreciate that I'm welcome. Indeed you is, and I'm just going to untie your hands long enough for you to take a sociable drink. Goes to stranger, feels in all pockets for weapons. I don't reckon you're traveling peaceable. Unties hands. Won't you sit down? Uh, thank you. Yes, sir, mister. Boys ain't seen one of you fellows for near two years. Began to think you was going to neglect us. I was hoping you might be Jim Dunn. <laughs> Have a drink? Uh, no, thank you. Your make is too strong for me. Ain't no luck to drink alone. You get company. Better have some. Very well, my friend. I suffer willingly. <coughs> <coughs> I reckon y'all don't like the flavor <coughs> of liquor that ain't been stamped. It's not so bad. Last revenue to sit in that chair got drunk on my make. That wouldn't be difficult. No, nope, but it was awkward. Why? I had to wait till he sobered up before I gave him his ticker. I didn't feel like sending him to heaven drunk. He'd have found it awkward climbing that golden ladder. A thoughtful executioner. So, you see, maybe you can delay things a little by dallying with the liquor. Revenue picks up cup, gets it as far as his lips, slowly puts it down. The price is too great. I'm mighty sorry you ain't Jim Dunn, but I reckon you ain't. You don't answer his likeness. Who's Jim Dunn? You ought to know who Jim Dunn is. He's just about the worst one of you revenue critters that ever hit these parts. You got four of the boys in jail. We got a little reception all ready for him. See that? Pointing to sketch on back wall. Yes. That's Jim Dunn. Hmm. Doesn't look much like anyone. Well, that's what Jim Dunn will look like when we get him. I'm mighty sorry you ain't Jim Dunn. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Luke, turning to cupboard and filling pipe. Oh, it's all right. I reckon one revenue's about as good another, after all. Are you sure I'm a revenuer? Well, since we catch to climbing trees and snooping around the stills, I reckon we won't take no chances that you ain't. Oh. Say, maybe you'd like a cigar. Here's one I've been saving for quite a spell back, thinking maybe I'd have company someday. Oh, no, thank you. Brings out dried-up cigar, hands it to him. Ain't no luck to smoke alone when you got company. Striking match and holding it to Revenue. You better smoke. Revenue bites off end and mouth is filled with dust, spits out dust. <coughs> Luke holds match to cigar. With difficulty, Revenue lights it. That's a good a five-cent cigar as you can get in Henderson. <sighs> After two puffs, makes wry face throw cigar on table. Mm. You make death very easy, mister. Luke's my name. You can call me Luke. Make you feel as though you had a friend near you at the end. Luke Hazy. Not the Luke Hazy that cleaned out the Crosby family. How'd you hear about it? Hear about it? Why, your name's been in every newspaper in the United States. Every time you killed another Crosby, the whole feud was told all over again. Why, I've seen your picture in the papers twenty times. They never had one took. Well, that don't stop them from printing it. Don't you ever read the newspapers? Me read? I ain't read nothing for thirty years. Reckon I couldn't read two lines in an hour. Yeah, uh, you've missed a lot of information about yourself. How many Crosby did they say I killed? I think the last report said that you had just removed the twelfth. It's a lie. I only killed six. That's all they was. Growed up. I'm a-waiting for one now. It's only thirteen. When'll he be ripe? Just as soon as he comes a-looking for me. Will he come? He'll come if he's a Crosby. A brave family. They don't make him any braver. They'd be first-rate folks if they wasn't Crosbys. If you feel that way, why did you start fighting them? I never started no fight. My granddad had some misunderstanding with their granddad. I don't know just what it was about, but I reckon my granddad was right, and I'll see it through. 
You must think a lot of your grandfather. Never seen him, but it ain't no luck going again your own kin. Won't you have a drink? N no, n no, thank you. Well, Mr. Revenue, I reckon we might as well have this over. What? Well, you won't get drunk, and I can't be put to the trouble of having someone guard you. That'll not be necessary. Oh, I know you like this here place now, but this evening you might take it in your head to walk out. I'll not walk out unless you make me. Taint like I'll let you, but I wouldn't blame you none if you tried. But I'll not. Say, Mr. Revenue, I wonder if you know what you're up against. What do you mean? I mean, I gotta kill you. Well, that lets me out. What do you mean? I mean, I've been trying to commit suicide for the last two months, but I haven't had the nerve. Suicide? Yes. Now that you're willing to kill me, the problem is solved. Why, what do you want to commit suicide for? I just want to stop living, that's all. Well, you must have a reason. No special reason. I find life dull, and I'd like to get out of it. Dull? Yes. I hate to go to bed. I hate to get up. I don't care for food. I can't drink liquor. I find people either malicious or dull. I see by the fate of my acquaintances, both men and women, that love is a farce. I've seen fame and preference come to those who least deserve them, while the whole world kicked and cuffed the worthy ones. The craftier schemer gets the most money and glory, while the fair-minded dealer is humiliated in the bankruptcy court. In the name of the law, every crime is committed. In the name of religion, every vice is indulged. In the name of education, greatest ignorance is rampant. I don't get all of that, but I reckon you're some put out. I am. The world's a failure. What's more, it's a farce. I don't like it, but I can't change it, so I'm just aching for a chance to get out of it. And you, my dear friend, are going to present me that opportunity. Yes, I reckon you'll get your wish now. Good. If you only knew how I've tried to get killed. But why don't you kill yourself? I was afraid. Afraid of what? Hurting yourself? No, afraid of the consequences. What do you mean? Do you believe in another life after this one? Can't say as I ever gave it much thought. Well, don't. Because if you do, you'll never kill another Crosby. Not even a revenue officer. It ain't that bad, is it? Worse. Twenty times I've had a revolver to my head, crazy to die. And then as my finger pressed the trigger, I'd get a terrible dread. A dread that I was plunging into worse terrors than this world ever knew. If killing were the end, it would be easy. But what if it's only the beginning of something worse? Well, you gotta take some chances. I'll not take that one. You know, Mr. Luke, life was given to us by someone who probably never intended that we should take it. And that someone has something ready for people who destroy his property. That's what frightens me. You do too much worrying to be a regular suicide. Yes, I do. That's why I changed my plan. What plan? My plan for dying. Oh, then you didn't give up the idea. No, indeed. I'm still determined to die, but I'm going to make someone else responsible. Oh, so you ain't willing to pay for your own funeral music? No, sir. I'll furnish a passenger, but someone else must buy the ticket. You see, when I finally decided I'd be killed, I immediately exposed myself to every danger I knew. How? In a thousand ways. Did you ever see an automobile? No. They go faster than steam engines, and they don't stay on tracks. Did you ever hear of Fifth Avenue, New York? No. Fifth Avenue is jammed with automobiles, eight deep, all day long. People being killed every day. I crossed Fifth Avenue a thousand times a day, every day for weeks, never once trying to get out of the way, and always praying I'd be hit. And couldn't you get hit? <laughs> no. Automobiles only hit people who try to get out of the way. <sighs> When that failed, I frequented the lowest dives on the Bowery, flashing a roll of money and wearing diamonds, hoping they'd kill me for them. They stole the money and diamonds, but never touched me. Well, couldn't you pick a fight? I'm coming to that. You know, up north, they believe that a man can be killed in the south for calling another man a liar? That's right. It is, is it? Well, I've called men liars from Washington to Atlanta, and I'm here to tell you about it. <sighs> they must have took pity on you. Do you know Two-Gun Jake that keeps the dive down in Henderson? I should think I do. Jake's killed enough of them. He's a bad man, ain't he? He's no trifler. I wound up in Jake's place two nights ago, pretending to be drunk. Jake was cursing the niggers. He's always doing that. So I elbowed my way up to the bar and announced that I was an expert in the discovery of nigger blood. Could tell a nigger who was 63 64 white. You can? No, I can't, but I made them believe it. I then offered to look them over and tell them if they had any nigger blood in them. A few of them sneaked away, but the rest stood for it. I passed them all until I got to Two-Gun Jake. I examined his eyeballs, looked at his fingernails, and said, You're a nigger. And what did Jake do? He turned pale, took me into the back room. He said, Honest to God, mister, can you see nigger blood in me? I said, Yes. There's no mistake about it? Not a bit, I answered. Good God, he said. I always suspected it. Then he pulled out his gun eh, eh. and shot himself. Jake shot himself? Is he dead? I don't know. I was too disgusted to wait. I wandered around until I thought of you moonshiners, scrambled around in the mountains till I found your still. I sat on it and waited until you boys showed up, and here I am, and you're going to kill me. Oh, 
So you want us to do your killing for you, do you? You're my last hope. If I fail this time, I may as well give it up. Luke takes out revolver, turns sideways, and secretly removes cartridges from chamber. Rises. Who was that noise? Lays revolver on table and steps outside of door. Revenue looks at revolver, apparently without interest. Luke cautiously enters doorway and expresses surprise at seeing Revenue making no attempt to secure revolver. Feigning excitement, goes to table, picks up gun. I reckon I'm getting careless leaving the gun laying around here that away. Didn't you see it? Yes. Why don't you grab for it? What for? To get the drop on me. Can't you understand what I've been telling you, mister? I don't want the drop on you. Well, doggone if I don't believe you're telling me the truth. Thought I'd just see what you do. You see, I emptied it first. That wasn't necessary. Well, I reckon you'd better get along out of here, mister. You don't mean you're weak. I ain't got no call to do your killing for you. If you ain't sport enough to do it yourself, I reckon you can go on suffering. But I told you why I don't want to do it. One murder more or less means nothing to you. You don't care about the hereafter. Maybe I don't, but there ain't no use my taking any more chances than I have to. And what's more, mister, from what you've been telling me, I reckon there's a charm on you, and I ain't gonna take no chances going again charms. So you're going to go back on me? Yes, sirree. Well, maybe some of the other boys will be willing. I'll wait till they come. The other boys ain't gonna see you. You are leaving this place right now. Now! It won't do no good. You may as well go peaceable, because you ain't got no right to expect us to bear your burdens. Damn it all, I've spoiled it again. I reckon you better make up your mind to go on living. That looks like the only way out. Come on. I'll let you ride my horse to town. It's the only one we got, so you can leave it at two-gun Jake's and one of the boys will go get it. Or I reckon I'll go over myself and see if Jake made a job of it. I suppose it's no use arguing with you? Not a bit. Come on, you. Well, I'd like to leave my address, so if you ever come to New York, you can look me up. Ain't likely I'll ever come to New York. Well, I'll leave it anyhow. Have you a piece of paper? Paper what you write on. Never Hmm? had none, mister. Hmm. Revenue, looking about room, sees Jim Dunn's picture on wall, goes to it, takes it down. If you don't mind, I'll put it on the back of Jim Dunn's picture. Placing picture on table, begins to print. I'll print it for you, so it'll be easy to read. My address is here, so if you change your mind, you can send for me. Ain't likely. Come on. Both go to doorway. Luke extends hand. Revenue takes it. Goodbye, mister. Cheer up. There's a horse. Goodbye. Don't be so glum, mister. Let me hear you laugh just once before you go. (laughs) Oh, come on. Laugh out with it, hearty. (laughs) Hardier yet. <laughs> Luke watches for a moment, then returns to table, takes a drink, picks up picture, turns it around several times before getting it right, then begins to study. In attempting to make out the name, he slowly traces in the air with his index finger a capital J. Hold this right here. G. G E M Jim Jim Dun Jim Dun By God He rushes to corner, grabs shotgun, runs to doorway, raises gun in direction stranger has gone, looks intently, then slowly lets gun fall to his side and scans the distance with his hand shadowing his eyes, steps inside, slowly puts gun in corner, seats himself at table. Jim Dunn! And he begged me to kill him! The End This recording was by Klarsach and Greg Evans.